we hear an awful lot of talk about the word democracy in this country. We hear that our military uh, procedures are meant to spread democracy. We hear that we're a beacon of democracy. We, we hear that uh, the democratic principle should guide us. But do we even really know what democracy means or who its greatest adversaries really are? To judge, uh, to discuss that, uh, and perhaps to judge as well with me, is uh, Richard Wolf, our good friend Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf, of course, economist, economic historian, host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV, and so much more. So, uh, without further ado, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Thank you, RJ. Very, very glad to be with you again. So what do you think? Do we even know what we're talking about when we talk about democracy? Because boy, I hear people and see people with an awful lot of different ideologies and ways of looking at the world. And they all throw this word around and you know, it's a, it's a beautiful word, but is there even a common understanding of what it means? My, my short answer to your big question is no, there isn't a common uh, agreement, not at all. Like many important words, it has been used, and I would argue abused in countless ways for a whole host of different reasons in a big variety of contexts. So it's not even surprising that it has many different meanings, you know, like words, uh, other words do, words like love or freedom or a whole host of other really important concepts that, you know, are constantly demonstrating to us how many different meanings there are. Think of all the romantic relationships that have gone askew because the partners to them had very different notions of what, for example, the word love or the word commitment or the fill in the blank meant, right? Everybody kind of knows what I'm talking about. For me, democracy, and I agree with you, it's a beautiful idea as I understand it, means that the people rule themselves, that there is no other, that people are not divided between those who rule and those who are ruled. It is a notion of the collective of, an, of any community, local, regional, national, international, it is the people governing themselves, making the decisions about how they interact together for themselves. No kings, no queens, no all the rest of it. On that basis, to go to the second part of your introduction, I would argue that the capitalist way of organizing an economy, starting with the enterprise, the factory, the office, the store, where goods and services are produced, are performed, where the production and distribution of the goods and services we depend on for our lives are carried out. Those institutions, enterprises, for lack of a better term, workplaces, are organized in our capitalist system in a fundamentally undemocratic way. A tiny group of people, the owner of the business, the partners who own and operate the business, the board of directors, if it's the corporation form of a business, these are tiny groups of people sitting at the top of an enterprise whether it has 10 or 100 or 10,000 or 100,000 employees, a tiny group of people make the decisions. They are not accountable to the people, the employees, let's call them by their proper name. The employees do what the employer tells them to do, right? In the community where we live, we have the authority to vote, not always, not 100%, but we have a kind of authority to vote 
for the mayor who makes decisions we have to live with in that town. But in the workplace, and let me remind you, that's where adults spend most of their lives, in the workplace, especially if you count getting ready to go to the workplace, recuperating from a day at the workplace. It's that which organizes five out of seven days of your life. So in that workplace, a tiny group of people, employers, the U.S. Census measures employers as between one and three percent of the population, depending exactly on how you define it. But that means at least 97 percent of the people are not employers. Employers have all the authority. They decide what to produce. They decide what technology to use. They decide where production will happen. And they decide what to do with the output of the enterprise, even though everybody who works there played a role in producing whatever the goods and services are that flow out of the enterprise. So this is absolute opposite of democracy. It's autocracy. It's an autocracy of the owner, of the board of directors, of whoever sits at the top. And we all know, since we've all experienced it uh, in our lives, since we are surrounded by overwhelmingly, prevailingly capitalist, hierarchical enterprises. So we have the problem, to go back to the irony you began with, that our military are running around the world, bringing democracy, which is becoming a humorous aside, since we don't have the democracy for them to bring. And we never did. The ferocity with which we affirm that you have to be elected to be a mayor or a congressperson or a governor or a president, this accountability in the community where we reside has never been applied to the community where we work. And where is that written? What biblical injunction requires such an absence of democracy? And now the final point, which we are living with in a kind of explicitly extreme way these days. The final point is, if you organize your economy, its foundational productive institution and element, the enterprise, in a fundamentally undemocratic way, it is going to undermine whatever democracy you residually allow in the residential community, which is why the democracy we do have is mostly formal. We have the form of it, but not the reality. To say that a population can once a year go into a voting booth and fill out a form or move a lever, that's a form of democracy. But if you mean by democracy, the people rule, that's not a rule. Most of the people who vote don't have the time, don't have the leisure, don't have the information, don't have the education to rule in any meaningful sense, which most Americans for sure will tell you whether they are choose to be voters or not. So bottom line, democracy is a beautiful idea and it's a beautiful word, but capitalism has never had much use for it other than a very convenient veneer so that it could look a lot better along that line of evaluation than it actually is. In other words, it's not genuine and we ought to face it because to make it genuine, something I personally advocate would be then a policy to change the economy from an undemocratic to a democratically organized one. And I spend a lot of time, just myself, working out, advocating for just exactly that change. And the system that we take for granted in this case, uh, this 
undemocratic economic system. Uh, you know, I was thinking as you were speaking about the history of it. And to me, you know, throughout global history, there have been examples of democratic economies. Some people like the anthropologist David Graeber and others, Mitchell Sollins, have taken it back to, you know, very prehistory, human prehistory. You have peasant, so-called peasant class revolts in Asia, you, have, you know, in multiple places around the world. But the, the law and the norms of this country, the United States, and and much of Western Europe too, I would say, uh, comes largely from English history, British history, and so on, Western Europe. And I think about, for example, the fact that this did not have to be this way. Some of the British Marxist historians, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Christopher Hill, for example, write about how uh, the uh, the English Civil Wars and how, uh, and there are others who have written at length about the enclosure movements, how the aristocracy began enclosing the common lands that that the villagers uh, would, uh, that rural people would, would share and farm and use in common and uh, enclosed those, drove people to the cities where they became employees, rise of modern capitalism, industrial revolution and all that. It seems to me that this undemocratic system we're talking about, far from being uh, reflecting a fundamental law of the universe, has only been around about three, four hundred years and had things gone a little differently at a couple of pivot points in history, that might not be the dominant system now. So it strikes me we shouldn't be assuming that's the only way it can be. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. I, I would add only, I remember from a, a freshman, my freshman year in college, having a professor talk about democracy and, and saying with glowing passion how we here in the United States, because I was a student here, uh, we have democracy and we take it from, this was in the words of this professor, the great original Athenian democracy. And he took us all the way back to ancient Greece. And he waxed poetic about uh, how everybody got together um, in the central uh, square of, of Athens and, and, and participated and talked debated at great length, and then everybody voted, and on and on and on. And I listened, and I took notes, and I learned about Athenian democracy. But it took a Marxist professor about four years later to mention casually that the majority of citizens in Athens and Sparta at the time of this great experiment in democracy were slaves, and none of this applied to them. Okay, all right, that prepared me to understand that the notion of democracy could be beautiful, could be inclusive, could really mean practically bringing everybody in, but it could also be also a veneer over its opposite, over the total absence in the in this case of the majority of people from any enjoyment of this beautiful concept. And I see it exactly in our society, this peculiar ability to wax poetic, as you put it earlier, constantly talking and celebrating something that isn't there. It's, it's you know, uh, it reminds me of a editorial years ago in Barron's magazine, you know, the publication of Dow Jones at the time, in which a very clever editorial writer having heard once too often about rugged individualism uh, being the trait of Americans, opened in that business or uh, periodical, opened his editorial by writing the following lines. American people make sheep look like rugged individuals. <laughs> You know, it was it was his way of being upset about what was what was going on at the time. But you can see that sometimes these qualities are celebrated precisely because they're absent. 
And by celebrating the idea, you make that absence more palatable. Well, and I would add to that, you know, I was thinking of uh, the political scientist Sheldon Wolin and his concept of inverted totalitarianism that, you know, one of the great innovations of the 20th century may have, and we, we could talk all about, you know, Edward Bernays, propaganda, public relations and all that, but the idea that perhaps, uh, I don't know if it's the most effective, but one of the most effective forms of totalitarianism is where you give people a choice between two very similar options because they're the, they're, they're, both of them exist within the only range you find permissible. And once they choose one or the other of the options, which you also affect through the infusion of enormous amounts of money into the political process, you then say, well, you can't criticize this system because it's democratic. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that don't get voted on in this democratic system. You know, I'm you know, like everybody else, I got to go out and get a job, no matter who gets elected, it's got to pay a certain amount of money for things that are not provided by the state, even though they could be, they could not provide it collectively, even though they could be where I live, I, I'm dependent on a motor vehicle, I'd rather not own one, uh, I could go on and on. But the point is uh, that this inverted totalitarianism, the idea that you know, like they like they used to say about the devil, his greatest trick was making you think he doesn't exist. That uh, perhaps that's totalitarianism's greatest trick nowadays too. Yeah, no, I, the, the country is addicted. This country to this notion of democracy as much or more than any other country that I know of. It, it is a mantra here. It is the clothing with which every politician arranges himself however distant from it in reality he or she is and today is we're full of people in american politics that are glaring uh, examples of this but we should and we have every right to call it for what it is if you wanted a democratic workplace just to make sure people are clear then you would say that the decisions I listed before, what to produce, how to produce it, where to produce it, and what to do with the products that everybody has helped to produce, those decisions should be made democratically, which means everybody at the workplace, one person, one vote, could decide by majority vote the answers to those questions. There's nothing written that requires those questions to be answered by a tiny group of unaccountable people who are there because they inherited the business from Grandpa Ezra, or they maneuvered some tax manipulation in order to capture that corporate uh, shareholder meeting and whatever the various routes are to being in that privileged elite. But democracy is the rejection of all of that. I sometimes make a joke in order to drive it home that the end of mon monarchy, the execution of those kings and queens in the French Revolution, the decision never to have a king when the United States broke from King George III in Britain at the time, the decision not to have a king was illusory. The kings outsmarted us. They changed their name, went inside the corporation, and have resurfaced with the name CEO. Because inside the enterprise, they have monarchical freedoms, including the freedom from not being held back by any democratic accountability whatsoever. And the long fight to break that down, to insist that there would be parliaments and congresses, and the executives could not, without a, a breakdown, division of forces and authority and all of that, we fought for that in the community where we live. We, we're just beginning to fight for it in the community where we work. 
But that's not because we don't need it there. And that's not because it's written anywhere that it mustn't or shouldn't be. And nor should anyone be persuaded by arguments like somebody has to be an authority. Somebody has to make the final decision. Those were the arguments invented by the kings and queens. And we have learned that they were BS. We don't need them. We've never gone back to them. And the only place they exist now are as a tourist attraction in London and a few other places, which is a suitable end for the mirage that they represented. Yeah, and there are places where you can go to see uh, how the kings got their heads chopped off too, you know. Just, but, uh, you know, and of course, kings ruled with the argument that they had the divine right to rule, that God had granted them the right to rule. Uh, and the kings of the workplace have a similar, albeit secular argument, right? They, they make the argument that we live in a meritocracy and that therefore, uh, Anybody can be CEO if they're just the best at it than anyone else, leaving aside what you inherit, leaving aside your cultural advantages, leaving aside a job description that self-selects for predators, basically. And you, we've all seen those studies showing a, uh, supposedly showing a higher incident of uh, sociopathy among CEOs and so on. But, you know, it, it stands to reason this is not a position that that uh, attracts uh, normal, well-balanced, generous, kind people. So, uh, and we see it in our, you know, the, the ruling elites we have around us today. But all of this raises a question that, uh, first of all, two questions, I guess, at least, both giant. One is this um, supposed um, dichotomy between democracy and personal freedom. In other words, I should have the personal freedom to acquire or inherit massive amounts of wealth with which I control everybody else's life. And therefore to restrict that as a restriction on my freedom, you, the worker, the vast majority of people in this country have the freedom. If you don't like my, uh, my company, you can go work somewhere else. Well, of course the workers have to get another crappy job at another crappy company for another jerk like you <laughs> but but uh, you know that's that's the illusion of freedom that gets raised so that's argument number one and argument number two is how are you know how could auto workers possibly run uh, something as complicated as an auto plant but let's start with the as an example you know how could how could uh you know uh, key grips and and prop masters run Netflix or what have you. And I, but I guess let's start with the first one. What do you think about this freedom versus democracy business? I love it because it is so thin that you realize it needs to be taught, particularly to children, in such a way that you give them the the message, and then you give them an example. And you carefully choose your example because it is so easy if you break the connection to come up with the counter examples. And what's worked for me best in my life is the following. We constrain your freedom every time you drive through an intersection. There at the intersection is a sign in red saying stop. There's also a light which switches from red and green. You're in a hurry. You need to get somewhere. You have a romantic entanglement you wish to pursue. You have a, a, a quart of milk you need to buy. So you want to rush through the intersection, but you can't. Your freedom to meet your needs by rushing through the intersection is constricted by the sign and the light. Now what? Do we give up signs and lights so that you can have your freedom? No, because you'll kill yourself and your children and other people as you room into each other in that intersection. 
In other words, you recognize, and you always have, that your freedom is constricted in countless ways to enable, here we go, other freedoms. In other words, freedom and the lack of it are Hegelian twins. They're always together. There is no such thing as freedom for anybody without constriction of freedom for that person or somebody else or both. So the only honest thing to do is to ask about any freedom. If we give you that freedom, whose freedom is thereby constricted, right? If the child is going to be given the freedom to get up in the middle of the night and run around the apartment screaming, that's going to interfere with your freedom to enjoy a night's sleep. Every parent has to work that out. Somebody's freedom is going to be constricted so another person has some freedom. We're doing that all the time. Now, conclusion. If you allow one person, I'll pick a name, Elon Musk, to accumulate $200 billion or more dollars as personal wealth, that means you are denying to other people that wealth which would enable them to feed their hungry children, to get proper medical care. And how many? Well, if you got $200 billion, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are being denied something because you're allowing this person to accumulate freely in our capitalist system by means of investment, this amount of wealth. You could do that, but that, that let's be honest, you know what you're doing? You're allowing one person's freedom to trump another one. And I didn't use that word by accident. It's just like choosing to say, I'm gonna give my child the freedom to run around the apartment at three in the morning shouting and yelling, and my wife and I, our chance to sleep has to be sacrificed. Okay, but then don't pretend that you're in, fa in favor of freedom, because if you're honest, to say that you're in favor of freedom, as Hegel will show you, is to say that you're also in favor of freedom's twin, which is the absence of freedom somewhere else. And to make this concrete uh, in terms of, for example, work. We could talk about the uh, gains in productivity since when was it, 1968 or so, that those uh, stopped being shared equally, and equally isn't good enough, isn't fair enough, stopped being shared equally between employers and workers and, and began being monopolized by uh, by employers and investors, if those gains had been distributed uh, proportionally equitably to working people, working people might have the freedom now or might have the freedom soon as new computing technologies come online and so on to work four hours a week, eight hours a week, 10 hours a week instead of 40, 60 hours a week. But that's the kind of freedom that doesn't figure into conversations like this. And I also wanted to add, by the way, since you mentioned the traffic light, it's funny that you do because I wrote about this. I was at an economics seminar many years ago where someone used the thought experiment of uh, allowing wealthy people to pay for green lights at busy intersections. Their thought experiment was maybe you had a little device and if you wanted to spend 10 bucks to have the light turn green for you, you know, you, you press the thing, the light would turn green, you'd be charged 10 bucks or 20 bucks or 50 bucks, and your car would go through. And that way, that would be a way to regulate traffic. This was actually obviously a thought experiment, so not serious in that sense, but to me, so reflective of what the idea of freedom means to some people. And of course, my idea was, well, if you do that, I'll just find an expensive car and drive behind that guy because he's gonna go through every green light. But that's, you know, we have the equivalent of that today in some of these, um, these uh, rush hour lanes where yes. you can- uh, I, was about, 
I was just going to interrupt you, RJ. Yeah. Here in New York City, the, the law has been passed. I'm talking to you from Manhattan. The law has been passed. It goes into effect this coming year in 2024, where everybody traveling below a certain street and all that will be charged a, a fee. And so you've made the decision that we have congestion and we're not going to solve the congestion in a way that affects everybody equally. We're going to make it a money issue. So if you're rich, of course, you don't care. Right. And if you're poor, it's going to dis you know, inconvenience you enormously in all kinds of what. And this is the mentality because you can look at it because you're trained to without seeing. You can see who gets more freedom and you're carefully educated in not understanding at whose expense this freedom. Allowing Mr. Musk to rip off X dollars from every Tesla sold by virtue of some arcane law that even though he had nothing to do with it, other than maybe some organizational skill at the beginning, now that he's disconnected from any ongoing relationship, he's busy destroying the Twitter organization. Okay, you know, who cares? He shall have the freedom in perpetuity to destroy whatever else he wants, to send things to the moon. to do... And the rest of the population who can't solve the problem, one in, in four children in New York City was just declared to be food insecure, which is a euphemism for hungry. All right, we're allowing, uh, you, you don't have the freedom to get a decent meal, you child. Meanwhile, this guy has the freedom to play amusements in the world, having visits to the moon, having more children than anybody else can manage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Extraordinary to call all of this freedom and democracy. I mean, that takes real skill because you, you know, to 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 believe that the Chihuahua you're faced with is actually uh, an African gorilla is an achievement if you stick with that story. Or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> that this giant uh, edifice of democracy is really a little yappy chihuahua. Uh, well, maybe in our next conversation or a future conversation, Richard Wolf, we can talk about how this might play out in real life. I mean, we're not going to be advocating paying for green lights at busy intersections, but it would be fascinating, and I don't have any brilliant ideas, maybe you've thought this through, but I'm going to be thinking about it. You know, how would this look? How would this work? How would we get a chance to really vote on uh, or in other democratic ways? Obviously, we can democratically run our workplaces. So that would be a big step. But, you know, there have been models through history, right? I mean, there have been attempts there. Uh, the father of a friend of mine was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, where they had uh, anarcho syndicalism. I mean, you have all these different models for maybe guilds or unions can negotiate with one, you know, one another or whatever. But but it would be really interesting to kind of think about what this might look like in real life. I don't know. What do you think for a future discussion? Yeah, I think so. And I would love to have an opportunity to talk to people about about worker co-ops. They exist all over the world. There is a long history. The most famous of them is in, in Spain called the Mondragon Corporation. Just even to talk about that, you know, here it is, it's 70 years old, roughly, and it's the seventh or eighth largest corporation in all of Spain now. It is a worker co-op. It has all kinds of procedures. It has outcompeted all kinds of capitalist enterprises. It's a great success story for Spain, even though it chose to be a worker co-op, democratically organized, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, it's not as though this idea hasn't been tried. It has been. So the actual question is, given its history, given both its successes and failures, and stacking them up against the successes and failures of capitalism, it becomes an open question. And one would think that a rational society, given that it's an open question, would have 
the two kinds of economic system operating side by side so that people could shop and see what they think, work there and see what they, and understand, right. and it goes back to your earlier point, in a rational democratic society, there would be a rational democratic decision about whether the economy should be 50-50 co-op capitalist, 40-60, 30-70, 100% one way, or the that would be a discussion since it affects how you shop, how you live, and everything else about the society you live in uh, will be shaped by what kind of industrial organizational structure you actually choose in a society. It is being chosen now, just not in a democratic way. And Mondragon, for example, as I understand it, is quite large. I think it's around yep. 100,000 or more. Yep. And so, so it's not as if the problems of democratic uh, governance in a larger company can't be solved. So that would be interesting. It would be also interesting to see whether all of the policies that encourage private enterprise in this country, whether a few could be developed to encourage uh, collective enterprise, since we appear to have very little interest in that among our political class. Yeah, well, you know, we solved that problem. I like to remind people. We have institutions that provide government support to minority owned businesses. We have institution to support uh, women, uh, businesses owned and operated by women uh, to correct historical uh, discrimination against them. Even longer than both of those, we have a small business administration that gives preferential help to small businesses because they recognize, even though they dare not say it quite so explicitly, that capitalism hurts small businesses and favors big business. All right, here's a revolutionary thought. How about an agency that provides assistance, low, low interest loans to cooperative enterprises on the grounds that in a democratic society, we have to give our people the chance to observe to participate, to work for these kinds of uh, enterprises so they can make an informed, intelligent, democratic choice as to what kind of economy they want. Here's to be a wonderful idea, and yet we're, we're light years from any of that. And I won't, I won't bore you by telling you that having spent some of my life in business schools, uh, they don't teach you how to organize a cooperative business. Their curriculums are 99.9% .9 on the assumption that if you're in business school and you want to learn about business, you want to learn about a capitalist business. That's a way to make sure no one thinks of an alternative because you have excluded it from the curriculum on the grounds of no justification at all. No, you probably want to be the boss if you're getting an MBA. And I'll end with this. Uh, a law firm I read this morning proudly announced that its artificial intelligence program for co negotiating contracts just negotiated its first contract with another artificial intelligence program without human intervention. I look forward to the day when a human run, democratically run mm -hmm. company negotiates its first major contract with another human-run, democratically-run company. Yeah. Then we'll know we're on our way.